Folks, there are about five things you can easily do to make your rifle happy. They are a trigger job, an action bedding job, achieving a good cheek weld, installing the suppressor, and smoothing up an action that may feel like it's got gravel in it. And we're gonna talk about how to do each of those. Whether to do this DIY on your own, right? Or to hire a gunsmith is the first question that we need to address. And uh, it's a good question because if you're real handy with tools, if you have some time in the evenings and weekends, and if you like the sense of achievement that comes with, you know, doing things like this on your own, uh, by all means, do these, uh, these steps yourself. If on the other hand, you've got, uh, the ability of Mr. Bean with tools and um, have very little time or either one, or simply don't really trust yourself to work on your beloved hunting rifle. Find a good gunsmith in the area and hire him. Sometimes, actually most of the time, if you're talking about time invested, it's actually cheaper to hire a gunsmith because when you're doing a DIY job, you need to take your time. Be very methodical and precise. Do a lot of research on YouTube. And uh, reading is even better. And uh, figure out how to do things just right, then take your time to do them properly. Let's start with number one, a trigger job. This is what I feel like is often the single most beneficial thing that you can do for your hunting rifle, whether it's simply adjusting uh, an already existing trigger or having a custom trigger installed. Now, what does a trigger job achieve for you? Folks, it's really all about making that go switch easy to function without disturbing your aim or the follow through of the rifle during the shot. If you have a heavy trigger that forces you to work to get it to release or a gritty trigger that kind of grinds as it uh, as it releases or prior to release. It's very difficult to get a clean, uh, precise shot off. So there are two ways that you can address this. One is with you know a good user adjustable trigger. This is a Browning X-Bolt and most modern hunting rifles in that mid to upper tier come with adjustable triggers now. This one has one of the best. Uh, there's instructions that come with the rifle on how to adjust your trigger. Or you can look that up online or on the website or whatever. And you can make a very nice trigger on a standard, on most of the modern standard production grade rifles these days. Now this one, this is a custom rifle and it has a Timney trigger in it. There are several different grades of match grade triggers from Timney and Trigger Tech and Jewel and several other good makers. I'm partial to the Timneys. I've used them all and they're all good. The key with these is you can usually order them whatever poundage weight you want, plus they're user adjustable. So once you've got it, if you want it a little lighter or a little heavier, you can do that. They're gonna be, as the old saying goes, as crisp as an icicle breaking when they release. There'll be no uh, squishiness, no slop or take up as you address that trigger. Something like this is usually user adjustable on most models in anywhere from about five minutes to 30 minutes. Some are more challenging than others, but most of them, it's a very simple process. So that is your number one step toward achieving a, a better accuracy, a rifle that's happier, a rifle that's easier to shoot accurately. Next on our list of processes is having your action glass bedded into your rifle stock. Now, this is generally applicable to wood stocks and to composite stocks, right? Most of the chassis type stocks, meaning made with aluminum, magnesium, and so forth these days have uh, action bed machined into them. That's kind of a V block situation that serves as action bedding. But when you're talking about a wood stock or a carbon fiber or fiberglass stock, any type of composite stock that's not injection molded, it's almost always worth having some good bedding in there to stabilize your action. Now, why is this? Folks, if you have a, a rifle action, a barreled action in a stock 
that's a little bit loose, it's going to shift position slightly between shots. Every time that recoil jars that action, causes it to flex and vibrate and all these harmonics running up and down the barrel and affecting that action, it's gonna leave it placed slightly different each time. So the launching pad for your projectile is now positioned ever so slightly different every time and that will affect your group size. It'll make it bigger, right? So the other thing that can happen with a, a stock that has not been bedded is that when you tighten the front and rear screws, it can, it can apply some bend to the steel in the action. Now that's very good steel and it'll spring right back when you release the tension on those screws. However, that bend in the action can, in extreme cases, cause a little binding in your bolt travel. More frequently, what you'll see is a degradation in accuracy because of the tension in that action. And by bending it, even just a few thousandths, you're now creating an action that is no longer true, right? We talk about blueprinting an action or truing it up. That uh, That's important, but if you're bending your action when you screw it into your stock, you kind of nullify those accuracy benefiting uh, methods of building a fine rifle. So in here you can see it's a little bit hard because this is a green stock with green bedding in it to match. That just tells you it's a masterful job. I like personally full length action bedding, although most people now just do a spot bed around the recoil lug and the rear tang. Personally, like I say, I like the full length bedding, keeps debris from getting in there, just offers a little better support, but it's more expensive. Or if you're doing it yourself, it's more time consuming. I also like about an inch and a half to two inches worth of the barrel shank bedded myself. That's very much a matter of preference. A lot of gunsmiths only bed to the front of the receiver ring, and that's just fine. They all work. The key is to do the, the bedding properly if you're doing it yourself. Do plenty of research, plenty of reading, and take your time, folks. Or get a very, very good gunsmith to do that work for you. What's the benefit? Well, then when you torque your front and rear action bolts to proper spec, that action will be held precisely the same, stress-free, torque-free for every single shot. And folks, I have witnessed this dozens of times over the years where groups will go from very ho-hum or disappointing to spectacular at 100 yards, well, any distance really, from simply betting the action. Now, what's the best place to get started? Go to Brownells. This is a, a shop that just supplies good... Uh, gunsmithing supplies and uh, get Acroglass gel. That's my favorite compound to work with. Pretty simple, not super expensive, and uh, does a fantastic job in uh, supporting that action. Now, third on our list of tricks to make your rifle happy, and you happy as a shooter as a result, is to have your cheek rest exactly the right height to align your eye up with the scope. Now, this is a, a Tika T3X TAC A1. It's really a, a rifle designed for PRS type competition. Superbly accurate, and it comes with an adjustable cheek rest. You just loosen some uh, levers or knobs and raise or lower it in its slots until it aligns your eye with whatever scope you've got mounted on that rifle. These work very well, but they tend to be heavy. And on a hunting rifle, or even a light rifle designed for something like NRL hunter competition, where you uh, have to have less than 12 pounds, including your bipod and all your accoutrements, the adjustable cheek rests have traditionally been a little too heavy. The metal in them, the various uh, aspects of them, have typically weighed up to a pound and a half more than just the stock. So you're adding a lot of weight by going to a traditional adjustable cheek rest on a composite stock. However, modern versions are being made out of carbon fiber and with um, very lightweight components. So that weight has come way, way down. Meanwhile, there's a method that I've used for years that weighs just four ounces, and that's to use a stock pack with adjustable shims in it. You can see I've got three or four of these shims stacked on top of this rifle right here. This is one of my personal uh, most accurate rifles. I use this for PRS competition, for NRL hunter competition. And with these shims, they're a material that's almost like uh, what your mouse pad is made at, out of right there by your computer, right? You can make that cheek rest height any height you want it to align it perfectly, to align your eye perfectly with your scope. 
Now, how important is this? You know, you can learn to achieve a pretty good jaw weld or chin weld rather than a cheek weld. But traditionally, especially sniper trained marksmen will teach you to kind of hook low and they call this cheek meat, this bulge you get and settle your head and let the entire weight rest here. That takes all the tension, the muscle tremors out of your neck and will help you shoot more consistently and more cleanly. This is especially crucial to snipers who may lay in position for hours on end, looking through their scope, waiting for that few second opportunity to try and hit their target. Uh, it's a little less crucial for hunters, but the accuracy element is no less crucial. For a good example, I've got a friend that had a wonderful custom rifle built on a pre-64 Model 70 Winchester action with a Krieger barrel and a nice McMillan stock. Now he put the barreled action in the stock himself and a few weeks after he'd started shooting it, he called me just frustrated and he said, this thing shoots worse than it did with the original barrel in the old woodstock. I can't get better than like inch and a half to two inch groups at 100 yards. I said, all right, let's go shoot. We'll take a look at it. And we shot, and sure enough, it was woefully inad inaccurate. And I got to looking at it, and I could see some pretty sizable gaps around the action in his McMillan stock. And I said, who bedded this for you? Did you glass bed this yourself? And he looked at me funny, and he said, well, I just bolted it into the stock. I said, okay, come over tonight. We'll get started. We're going to glass bed this action into your stock for you. And we took about four or five days doing it very carefully, did our, the best job we could. And we went back and um, that rifle started shooting very, very well. But my friend still was throwing the occasional flyer. He'd have four out of five shots into you know, six tenths of an inch at 100 yards and then one would be out an inch. So frustrating for him. I was watching him shoot. Finally, I took one of these off of my rifle and I put it on his rifle and I said, try this again. His next group measured a half inch, five shots at 100 yards with a 30 out six. And he was sold. From then on, he didn't throw flyers anymore simply because he got a stable uh, rest, cheek rest, to help him consistently and precisely look through that scope for every single shot. It can make a big difference. Now, you're probably wondering what type this is. These are made by a company called Spec Ops Brand, and this is called the AccuPack. A-C-C-U hyphen P-A-C-K. You can generally find them on Amazon for 50 bucks or less. Now folks, you may find this one is a little bit unusual using a suppressor to increase accuracy. But I can tell you this, I test dozens of rifles every year for accuracy. And I have found that on average, about eight out of 10 benefit from installing suppressor on the end of the barrel. I believe this is because of the weight, the mass out there, possibly even the shape and the way it handles those gases jetting out of the muzzle. I believe it tames harmonics in the barrel and makes that rifle a more forgiving instrument to shoot accurately. A suppressor also reduces recoil nearly as effectively as a muzzle brake, so it helps you, the shooter. Another, of course, crucial thing that a, a suppressor, aka silencer, does is reduce sound. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with them, they're fully legal to own in most of the states and to hunt with, right? They reduce sound, they don't eliminate it. And it, a lot of that depends on how quickly your bullet is exiting the muzzle. If you're shooting in excess of the speed of sound, which is roughly about 1,100 feet per second, you'll always get that supersonic crack when it goes out. There's no way you can silence that. If you're shooting something like a 22 with subsonic ammunition, it's very, very quiet indeed. But for our purposes on a hunting rifle, the suppressor is going to reduce sound to hearing safe levels. And any more... Uh, it's the civilized thing to do, folks. It reduces recoil, it protects your ears, and it makes your rifle more accurate in most cases. Now, what kind do you want to get? You know, for hunting, I like something that's compact and light, ideally less than 12 ounces and less than 7 inches in length. There's a lot of good ones out there. Probably the best ones for hunting are made out of titanium because they're very light. They do cost a little bit more. I do like to put a suppressor cover on mine as well because it actually adds a little bit of sound reduction that's been proven by some of the major companies that make suppressors but more importantly when you're shooting in cold weather and your suppressor heats up from three or four shots and starts shimmering with heat waves 
suppressor cover prevents that from distorting your view through the scope. Also, if you're dragging it through the brush and you get a branch that hits it or drags along it, you get just a, almost a, an organic sound rather than that metallic ting that you will on a bare suppressor. Just a couple of thoughts on using them. But the key thing is, folks, these can be a very useful tool for increasing accuracy. I've got a couple of rifles that are just mm, kind of middle of the road shooters. They'll shoot an inch and a half group every time I get behind them without a suppressor. Screw a suppressor on and they are bona fide, predictable, dependable, reliable, three quarter inch or less guns at 100 yards. It's pretty impressive uh, transformation. Now, most center fire suppressors come in a 30 caliber configuration. That means you can use them on any 30 caliber and lower uh, size of cartridge. And they'll come generally with 5 8 by 24 or a half by 28 thread pitch. The half by 28 thread pitch is typically used on 22 caliber center fires. Everything from, let's say, the 22-250 down through the uh, 223 Remington 5.56 NATO, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and of course, works well on smaller center fire cartridges such as the 22 Hornet, the uh, 204 Ruger, 17 Remington and so on. The best of the modern hunting suppressors come with two different inserts that go into the rear, one with each thread pitch. So whatever muzzle threads your rifle has, you'll be set. You just install the correct insert, spin your suppressor on, and off you go. The last step that I put on my list of these five things you can do to make you and your rifle happier is to tune up your action. And in many cases, this isn't necessary. You'll find that the modern uh, Browning X-Bolts and the Tika rifles and the Weatherby 307 and so forth, these modern rifles tend to be very, very smooth in operation. And even in a rifle that's a bit clunky and not smooth, as long as it feeds reliably, it's, um, it's a feel thing. It's not necessarily crucial, right? It's not gonna increase your accuracy to smooth that uh, action up probably not even going to increase your effectiveness for most of your shots in the field unless you need to shoot fast and reliably. So this can be very important for dangerous game rifles or anything like that. Now, what type of actions do you find that are generally a little bit um, rough? Mm, hate to say it because I love controlled feed, controlled round feed actions, anything based on the old Mauser 98s, but the modern iterations of them, such as this Ruger M77 Hawkeye, uh, even some of the uh, Montana Arms rifles and so forth that come off the line, less so the Winchester Model 70, I'm not sure why, but a lot of these modern controlled feed actions with a big long claw extractor are a bit grindy feeling. Uh, I've sometimes tongue in cheek said they feel like the action's full of gravel, right? And it's not real fun to work, whether you're at the range or in, in the field hunting, right? So there's something you can do about it. You can use an abrasive polishing compound like this one from Brownells. This one is a 600 grit. Anything in that neighborhood should work just fine. Same sort of stuff you'd use for lapping scope rings, which is a topic for another time. And you coat the bearing surfaces that, uh, that ride against each other inside your action with that and just run your bolt forward and back, in and out. You wanna be careful to keep it off the back of your recoil lugs on your bolt so that you don't mess with headspace at all, but that's not too hard. It's more just a finicky, fiddly, messy, time-consuming process that can bring great results. I have a, a 416 Ruger in a, a Hawkeye African that's just a wonderful rifle that I got for a dangerous game hunt. and. It was one of those that felt like it had gravel in the action. I spent the duration, as I like to say, of the movie Dances with Wolves running that bolt. So nearly three hours, right? I actually sat on the living room floor with a newspaper spread under me so I wouldn't get goop on uh, my wife's nice rug. And I worked that bolt, freshening the, the polishing compound now and then, as I watched Dances with Wolves to the very end. And then I took it all apart, cleaned it good, and that rifle now feels like, uh, you know, another uh, proverbial old saying, it runs like grease on glass. 
ultra smooth, ultra reliable, and it can really benefit the way your rifle feels. The crucial thing when polishing an action, folks, is patience and attention to detail. Just recognize it's a messy, messy process. And pay attention. Uh, make sure that you don't get, uh, that you don't do anything that will adversely affect the rifle. Of course, as I mentioned, the primary potential there is for to, to grind down the back of the recoil lugs um, by putting grinding compound there. Just keep it off. It's not a problem. I really like to use baby wipes as a, a control and uh, an aid in cleaning up the drips and the messes here and there as I work. I do like to put polishing compound anywhere that your bolt shows a little bit of burnishing. That's kind of key to helping it uh, polish in the right places. So once you've got it lubed up good with your compound, you just go ahead and start working it in and out of that action and it'll be a little gummy at first. That's okay. Just find its equilibrium and work it forward and back. And you'll have to reapply a little bit now and then. You'll have to get in with Q-tips and your baby wipes and clean it up. This will absolutely change the way your bolt feels. Another thing you can do as well, once you've got all those surfaces polished, is get in with some 600 to 1000 grit sandpaper and knock all the sharp edges off the feed rails. The inside of the feed rails will actually uh, polish up on the top and will take a little bit of a razor edge just from the work of the bolt locking lugs running up and down them. So it's important to go in there, polish your feed ramp a little bit and just use your pinky finger. Doesn't take much to make a big difference. And there you have it folks, five ways to make your hunting rifle happy. And as we all know, a happy rifle makes for a happy hunter. Thanks for tuning in today, folks. I'm Joseph Von Benedict here, co-hosting on Ron Spomer Outdoors. Also check out my podcast, the Backcountry Hunting Podcast, which we uh, tell stories, we uh, strive to entertain, educate, and inspire with all things outdoors and hunting uh, with a, a gear and shooting uh, emphasis. So uh, as Ron Spomer would say, folks, hunt honest and shoot straight. I'm Joseph Von Benedict, and I'll see you in the backcountry.